this second session is sponsored uh, by Gautier Seminars, and we have a short sponsorship video um, before we start this session. So uh, enjoy the video. Thank you, Gautier. Okay, well, our next speaker is Rikesh Pranjmachia from Kantar Panel uh, to give us a roundup of uh, this year's experiences in the retail sector. Rikesh, welcome to the conference and uh, over to you. Thank you, Phil. Hi, everyone. Um, as uh, Phil mentioned, my name is Rikesh. Um, it's a pleasure to present for my second um, consecutive British Tomato Conference, so really, really, really glad to be here. And um, today we're going to present um, a year in tomato retail, so understanding some of the key trends within tomatoes that have happened over the past year and what you'll be expecting going forward. So before we kind of go into tomatoes, I just really want to set the scene here and uh, understand how total produce has performed over the past year. Now, we know produce and its many challenges um, over the past year with labour shortages, um, no lorry driver shortages, we've got now the gas prices increasing, so it's a really tough time for the industry. But from a consumer perspective, you know, £12.3 billion pounds going to the tills for total produce over the past year, which represents a 2.1% increase in value and a 4.5% increase in volume. You can see the average prices there starting to creep down from the retailer front and having discussions with, with many clients over the past few weeks. You know, it's been rising cost prices within production, uh, which are really hindering um, the manufacturer and supplier, whereas the, the consumers are really benefiting from the slight price decrease within stores. So definitely a discussion to be had uh, for that. In other metrics, we've seen trip size actually increase. So by trip size, I mean bigger baskets. Uh, frequency is about 100 trips per year, and that's starting to soften slightly too. And of course, penetration, pretty much everyone has bought uh, a piece of fruit or veg in the last year. When we look at tomatoes, though, specifically, we can see the evolution of tomato spend since 2018. Um, so not much movement between 2018 and 2019, but actually due to COVID, a huge rise in spend within tomatoes. And we're almost reaching that billion pound category. And when we think of billion pounds, we think of the likes of berries, for example, and tomatoes are reaching uh, that milestone. So what can uh, we say about this growth? Why is the growth um, so significant? So value up 5.6% over the past year. Now each of those colors represents a different KPI. So if I draw your attention uh, to this kind of the top barometer uh, bar chart there, we can see anything to the right of the line is adding value into the market. So shoppers making more frequent trips for tomatoes, shoppers putting more in their basket, and slightly higher prices have actually all benefited the tomato category. Only a slight lot of shoppers um, have kind of taken out some contribution out of the market, but it's fairly insignificant compared to the value gained uh, by those key metrics there. It's really interesting to see though, actually, with, with price actually increasing across multiple produce categories, you see a massive price um, deflation, particularly with the likes of, of brassicas and potatoes. And it seems like tomatoes here from the retailer side of things have not, uh, not seen the similar trends uh, with those other categories. And you can see the real effect of COVID here. Um, so pre kind of March 2020, 2020 um, you can see that 
higher prices have actually been propping up the market from a contribution sense with the, the purple bar contributing pretty much every single period. And then when COVID hit, um, as we know, shopper behavior changed dramatically. And we saw that bigger baskets, and in this case, more frequent trips uh, were contributing to tomato growth. And it kind of reached its, uh, its highest point, um, kind of March 21 this year. Um, we're starting to analyze now on some really tough uh, numbers. And we've seen that across the board too. But with tomatoes, quite interestingly, now frequency has become the key driver for growth in the in the latest 52 week ending. So personally, I think this is really important so that this continues. With a higher penetration category, such as tomatoes, you're not really looking to get new shoppers in. You're looking to utilize those existing shoppers, really understand the needs of the consumer and get them into more occasions. And we're going to touch upon this uh, a bit later on. So that frequency change, um, you know, is, is it seems like a quite a small shift over the past year, you know, from 26 to 26.7 trips on average. But actually, frequency is a really hard metric to turn. You know, from 2018 to 2021, you know, shoppers have made on average one additional trip. So you can see just how much effort it, effort it takes to actually get a shopper to make an extra trip. Um, so it's really important to understand the second part of that journey, which is the consumption journey. And then trip size as well. Another another really hard metric to actually um, you know, gain a massive foothold. So 0.42 kilograms to 0.44 over the past three to four years or so. But we are making bigger trips. And we've seen this at a total grocery level. You know, it's not just the tomato thing. It's not just the produce thing. It's something we've seen um, across, the, across all grocery categories where bigger baskets have been really key. So we talked about a few different metrics there, but I think it's really important just to take a step back to understand the wider trends. And I just I just um, touched upon consumption, and this is something that we've been tracking at Cantor for many years. So just to give you a, a kind of an understanding of how we capture the data, so a subset of our purchase panel, 11,000 individuals, they fill out an online diary four times a year. So not only we can understand the purchase element, we can also understand the consumption element, which to be honest is just as important. And you can see the consumption behavior um, trends over time. So from 2016 till 20, 2020, just before COVID, 5.2 billion occasions there of in-home consumption. And that didn't change too much over you know, three to four years. And then you can see the effect of COVID here, massive increase of in-home consumption, 7.1 billion, its highest point in May 2020. And actually since then, it's been slightly erratic and a lot of this has been due to um, different lockdowns, different restrictions being introduced from the government, et cetera. And at the moment, we're on 5.96 billion occasions. So we're well ahead of anything we've seen previously. And actually, we've increased our in-home occasions versus the previous month by 133.7 million, which is about a 4% increase versus the previous month. So thinking about the opportunity for tomatoes, the opportunity for produce, Yes, it's a high penetration category, we know that. There's still a massive amount of occasions to win uh, within the in-home lunch occasion. However, we do have to bear in mind um, a few different things. So not only can we track overall occasions, we can understand at times of the day uh, which occasions are growing or declining. And there are three different bars here. The first bar is the green bar, and that represents the latest 12 week ending August data versus pre COVID. We then have the blue bar, that's 12 week ending August versus COVID, and the darker bar, which is 12 week ending August this year versus the previous year. So, first, we're looking at the total in home uh, occasion versus pre COVID, it's grown by 11%. And that's not a surprise. A lot of us have been at home naturally due to lockdown, so we are going to consume more in home occasions. But what's really interestingly driving that occasion is the in-home lunch occasion. 27% change versus pre-COVID. The only thing I would bear in mind here is that we have seen a decline um, versus COVID and versus the previous year, mostly due to tough annualizations. Okay, so we saw in the previous chart, you know, kind of the peak reached around May time. Uh, so we are analyzing some really tough numbers, but you can see here versus pre-COVID, having lunch in home is a, is a massive opportunity and particularly for tomatoes. So diving in for tomatoes and how this all kind of ties up and relates together. So 
Tomatoes share a lunch is just under 50%, so 44.9, and it massively over-indexes versus those total produce. So that in-home lunch occasion, if you can tap into that, that's definitely an opportunity to get more shoppers to buy tomatoes more frequently to fulfill more needs to meet that uh, different number of occasions. And the lunch occasion in this case is absolutely important. Yes, evening meal is you know holds a, a decent amount of share, but actually it's the, it's the lunch occasion which um, seems to be the opportunity. Again, we have to understand the, the wider context here. Um, you know, some of the factors are involved and working from home has been uh, quite a big change for, I think, most of the most of the world, actually, in this case. And we've kind of been used to that version environment over the past year, year and a half, two years or so. So at Cantor, we also have the ability to send out questionnaires and understand the attitudinal aspects as well. So we sent out um, a questionnaire, did some field work back in April 2021, eight and a half thousand respondents. And we asked the question, how often was, does or will the main household in income earner, earner work from home in an average week? And we've got their responses here. So we've got three different bars, pre-COVID, during pandemic, and then you know, in the near future, what their thoughts are. I think what's really interesting is when you look at one day, two day, three day, four day, five day, you can see that during the pandemic um, for at least uh, three, four and five days is a lot higher than pre-COVID. And actually in the near future is also something they're considering about working from home. So if we can tap into that occasion, then then that's a really good, really good um, idea. However, we shouldn't forget there are many households who either never work or at home or don't work at all. So a bit, bit of a balancing game there. And the, the second part of this is, um, you know, shoppers are actually returning to more office more. Um, a lot of this is based around government legislation and lockdowns and obviously companies approach for a hybrid working potentially two to three days per week. So the other point to consider is actually focusing that carried out lunch occasion too. So yes, in home is just as important, but if, if they are going to work, you know, it's all also about understanding that particular um, opportunity there. So kind of going back towards tomatoes and the tiering is something that, again, we've been kind of a hot topic over the past year, particularly premium. Now, premium tomatoes have done rather well. Um, so 20.6% uh, volume and 17.4% value growth, which far outstrips any of the other tiers within tomatoes. And because of that really strong growth rate, we can see from August 2020 to August 21 this year, the share increase of premium to 13.6%. So yes, it's definitely a smaller part of tomatoes, but actually adding some value back into the market, it's really important. And we saw the uh, KPI metrics uh, a few slides back, which I showed you for tomatoes, and price actually um, contributed to growth, and premium is definitely a part of this. So adding value back into the category is important. It's not just about you know lowering the prices um, to rock bottom, which you know doesn't really help anyone. You're you're already rewarding existing shoppers who will buy that product anyway. So that's really important for a lot of retailers, retailers to understand. Um, a lot of retailers have adopted the loss leader mentality over the past few years. Aldi price match, you know, that, that's been quite a big focus over the past few months or so. But tomatoes in this case, it does show that people are willing to pay premium prices uh, for a really good quality product. And it's not just tomatoes which have seen growth in premiums, it's actually total produce overall. So again, yes, it represents a, a smaller volume share, 6.3%, but actually, again, premium versus the other tiers, double-digit growth, far stripping um, any of the other tiers. So, you know, it's definitely an area where um, manufacturers, suppliers, and retailers should all work together and consider the premium, the premium tier. So um, how do we capitalize on this opportunity? Well, online and premium are heavily linked and we've, we've seen some insight in this, and here I've demonstrated it. 17.2% of premium produce went through the online channel this year versus only 12% last year. It's a massive increase. Um, you know, almost one in four shoppers, you know, or, or pre almost one in four pounds spent on premium produce went through online. So it's really important. If you can actually link these two together, then you're definitely onto a winner. And if you can communicate the benefits of why a shopper should spend a little bit more on premium, you know, it's a lot easier to do that online 
uh, with you know the, the facility that online actually has versus in store. So again, a really good, really good insight to think about. So um, understanding some of the other channels. So yes, online intermarkets have done really well. So fifty three percent growth. And what's really interesting is that although a lot of channels are analyzing on those penetration gains made the previous year are really struggling to retain their shoppers. So you're seeing shoppers drop out of the market. But for online, it's really interesting. They've actually kept that momentum up. And the key driver for growth has been shoppers uh, buying tomatoes and returning to online to buy tomatoes over the past year. And that's been their biggest contribute to that frequency KPI. 53% uh, change there. And then from a retail angle, um, all retailers are limited by shoppers leaving the category. Only Carp and Asda record a year-on-year -year decline in the past 52 weeks. And at Canter, we always talk about retaining shoppers. You know, what are you doing to retain these shoppers? You've seen a huge surge last year, and now you're seeing the analyzation this year. So how can we retain those shoppers? It's, it's a discussion to think about. And, you know, a lot of retailers and manufacturers think, OK, well, you know, everyone buys tomatoes and the retailers don't really need to do anything about it. But actually, there's a lot of opportunity to uh, fulfill that under trade. So we're looking at retailer spend share here of salads versus tomatoes. And actually, several retailers pose an under trade versus their salad share. So just for example, if Asda um, achieved their fair share in tomatoes versus salads, that would represent uh, almost 11 million pound opportunity for them. And if you are over trading, then it's understanding how do we defend that over trade? We've seen shoppers drop out of the market. So what are you doing to keep them in? Um, and how do we actually grow the category further? I've presented a couple of opportunities there with premium and online. Uh, it would be good to, to hear everyone's, everyone's thoughts on that. So that, that's all I have for you today. Um, if you do have any further questions, then please um, drop me an email. You can also find me on LinkedIn uh, at Rikesh Pachmatia. But I hope you found that to be insightful. I um, hope you find the, that you can take some of these opportunities and insights away and discuss it with your retailer partners to drive uh, category growth within tomatoes. Thank you. Hi Rakesh, thanks very much for that. Um, I think the, uh, the internet gremlins still haven't, still haven't definitely left the yeah. building, I'm afraid. Um, I, I just uh, I was, didn't hear the very last part of your, your presentation, unfortunately. It might just be, if you have a couple of seconds, just cover the last uh, couple of, couple of uh, slides again for us. Would you mind doing that? And then we can, we'll straight on from that into, into, into questions, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, just give me a second. I'll just um, share my screen. Thank you, sorry to do that to you. No, no, it's fine. Great stuff. Um, so yeah, just, just the last few slides really. So I think what's quite interesting, we saw shoppers drop out of the market and a lot of that is due to annualization. So a huge surge during the COVID period, uh, but, but actually we've seen the effects of shoppers dropping out at the moment. And that's across the board. So you know, if you do want to maintain levels during COVID, it's all about understanding how do you retain those shoppers. And in order to understand that, we need to understand what needs that what needs needs fulfilling so targeting that in-home education if shoppers are actually going uh, back to work understanding how do we uh, target that carried out lunch occasion so if you can fulfill more needs more occasions then they're more likely to, to buy the product more often and it's something we've seen here in the frequency kpi but actually get the shoppers back in it's also a key target to to do that and then the final oh, yeah. slide i 
was uh, just uh, an opportunity for across retailers. You know, there's plenty of opportunity there, whether you're under trading or over trading. Under trading, Asda has the biggest opportunity um, to to fulfill their fair share of um, tomatoes versus salads. But actually, if you're over trading, it's understanding, okay, how long can we keep this over trade if we're still you know, losing shoppers? Uh, what mission types do we need to play in? What pack sizes uh, do we need to understand? What does the consumer want? What does the consumer need? What are they really looking for? I think the consumer has to be as part of part of that journey. Um, and understand price is a, a massive topic at the moment in general, in terms of retailer and buyer conversations. But actually, if the consumer can be a part of that conversation, then then you're onto a winner there. Um, so so yeah, that, that's all I had. And as I said, if you've got any questions, then um, feel free to drop me an email. Um, my email address is there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rakesh. That was absolutely fascinating, as as ever. And uh, thank you for for working with us with <laughs> overcoming the te technical challenges right at the end there. Um, obviously, the obvious question, and we've had some questions through uh, uh, from people listening. Um, one of the ones you've just sort of covered in that last little bit, actually, which is how do we continue post-COVID to, to, to keep these things moving? I mm -hmm. suppose if you sort of link that to people's changes in working pr practices, things, places, you know, places like sandwich shops, etc., obviously have had a massive negative impact. Uh, and as you've shown there, the home lunch event it has the opposite in, impact of that. It's to make sure that we because we sow our, our, our crops once a year to make sure we sow the right thing for 2022, trying to guess, I was going to say, or uh, forecast what it is that we think the market's going to do next year. Do you, do you think you've got any insight in that? Forecasting, uh, it is a difficult one because um, as another data we have, it's, it's all kind of up, up to the present at the moment, so we're going to make certain predictions. Um, but I say a lot of it is down to the government changes. So. God forbid we enter the lockdown, then we'll probably see some of the same behaviours that we saw initially, maybe less so from the, the impact, um, but we do have to consider when I work from home, that in-home lunch occasion, that's all really important. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that lead on to that is another question that we've got here, which is um, how do we balance the production of niche varieties versus the more common varieties? I suppose it links to what I said before, is, you know, what on earth are we going to sow for, ne for next year, really? I mean, we, we need that sort of classic tomato for the you know, one end of the range, don't we? And we still need to have that, the, the premium event that you've explained so well. It's about uh, trying to forecast that difference. And I suppose it's, it's down to individual retailer conversations, presumably. Is that the only, the only way forward? Yeah, I would say so. And again, I kind of go back to the consumption angle where different varieties will, deplay, will play in different occasions. So if you're concentrating on a particular variety and you know, promoting um, you know, if it's got if it's particularly sweet or you can go in a salad etc it's making sure that you are tapping into that particular need and if salads as a total cuisine are growing as a dish then that's fantastic i know tomatoes heavily rely on their host foods you know very rarely we just buy tomatoes going to store and just eating it as it is we have to consider what they're being consumed with and if those dishes are declining then actually you're already losing in that area so understanding what's growing at a total level how tomatoes can play in that but that's uh, that's how the retailers and manufacturers should go about that. Yeah, you make a good point there. I mean, rather than having a, a bag of sweets next to your computer when you're working from home, you actually should have a, a punnet of tomatoes. <laughs> Works better for you, tastes better, yeah, doesn't wipe your teeth. Well, maybe yeah. that's the solution there. <laughs> and that leads on to another question we've got here, actually, Rakesh, which is in previous years you spoke about uh, the health benefits of tomatoes. I mean, how, how important has that been with consumers now, given that they are closer attached to their food, there's more home cooking, etc. Are people generally more aware of the health benefits of food generally, and tomatoes in particular? No, that's a really good question. I think initially during lockdown, what we saw from a usage perspective was, you know, having a treat was, was more important than the health. So instead of having a piece of fruit, or maybe having that chocolate biscuit, for example, um, that was evident in kind of lockdown one, part of lockdown two. However, the tide is starting to change. So health is becoming a more important driver. It's more aware, more front of mind now. So again, promoting health benefits of tomatoes are really important and you know, have some way to go uh, of doing so. Appreciate, you know, private label is a little bit more difficult in store to promote that on pack, et cetera. But if you can promote it in any way possible, then then that's good to, to get into that need of consumers. Health is really important. Tomatoes are healthy. I will purchase tomatoes. Brilliant. Rakesh, as ever, 
absolutely fascinating. We could talk all day. We don't have time to, unfortunately. <laughs> but thank you ever so much for that insight. Really, really helpful. And uh, yeah, look forward to welcoming you uh, face to face at next year's event, hopefully. Thank you very thank much you indeed. Very Okay, following that, um, we have an insight now uh, into uh, how we went on and performed during the British Tomato Fortnight uh, promotion this week. Uh, and to help us do that and to talk through it, I can welcome um, uh, Nairi Ab Abamarshin. I hope I pronounced that right, Nairi. I'm really proud. I've been practicing and I've obviously got it wrong. So please, can you start by telling everybody what your name really is? <laughs> and then uh, I'll hand the stage over to you to tell us how we went on with British Tomato Fortnight. Thank you. Thank you. It's just too many letters, isn't it? You're yes. very close. It's Nairi Ambarchian, so you, you get nine out of ten. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, so I'm Nairi. Um, I'm the co-founder of Jack and Grace, which is the communications agency um, with Julie and many of you who were um, behind British Tomato Fortnight. Um, and I'm going to talk you through how that went. So just to start off, I wanted to look a little bit about why British Tomato Fortnight matters. Um, I know lots of you know this, but just as a kind of useful starting point and a bit of context. Um, we like bananas as much as the next person, but British tomatoes are definitely, definitely not a banana. And by that, I mean, you go into your supermarket, bananas are there. You don't really think about buying them. You just put them in your trolley. You don't really look at the price, they're cheap. Um, we definitely don't want people to be buying um, British tomatoes in that way. We want them to be looking for the British logo. We want them to be thinking about it and we want them to be spending where they can on the premium varieties. So that's a lot about what we're doing. It's about putting the tomato on a pedestal. And there was a great question asked to Rikesh a second ago about how we kind of manage um, the, the more common varieties plus the premium varieties. And the way that we've kind of positioned British tomatoes is both as staple and star, so that you've got kind of um, all of those needs met. So we're all about providing, you provide these amazing tomatoes, we help set the stage um, to kind of sell them. And the kinds of messages that we were looking to get across um, last year, uh, and always to be honest, are around the kind of British tomatoes being a premium product. It's the taste factor, the quality that we try and get across. Um, but also the health message, as Rikesh was saying, there's more to be done here, but particularly focusing on the kind of nutritional value, how healthy tomatoes are, um, the boost to immunity, the uh, improvements to heart health, and the kind of studies that have shown protection against cancer. And that buying British tomatoes is a benefit to uh, the British economy um, and a more sustainable option than kind of uh, imported varieties. So they're the kind of messages we're focused on. So if British tomato fortnight at any point or what we do seems fluffy to you, just to reiterate that it absolutely isn't. It goes to the absolute core of the commercial side of what you do, the sales side. Um, it's about kind of allowing you to have pricing resilience um, and, and push on those prices. Um, it shapes how retailers and consumers see uh, British tomatoes. So it's really, really important. And that's why we were so pleased this year um, that so many of you kind of got involved and helped us make it happen. So a few highlights. This year we launched the new logo um, and the new website, which had a much kind of a general refresh and update, but really focused on that consumer audience, um, positioning British tomatoes as the, the kind of luxury, good delicacy that they are, um, and focusing on everything that consumers might want. So hopefully some of you have, have seen that. And seeing the new logo in use has been amazing. So this is just a couple of examples here um, from on packs uh, in the co-op and on the Sainsbury's um, website um, where they went really big on, on British Tomato Fortnite again. Um, so really, really nice to kind of see those in use. And again, we, we work hard on British Tomato Fortnite and so does the board and Julie, um, but also so many of you got involved and kind of pushed the message. So um, it does make all the difference um, when you do that. 
And on the website, the amazing case studies. So um, there are there are a few carefully crafted case studies that just kind of highlight, again, very much focused on consumer audience, kind of bringing the growers to life so that they understand how much care and attention and skill and technology um, goes into producing the perfect British tomato. Um, and on each of these, they can kind of click for a bit more information. And each of the, the growers that we... Um, profiled have given up their time to kind of be involved in this um, so again it, it it's really really invaluable um, and if you want to be on there and you're not at the moment just let Julie know on the health side of things um, there was a report produced this year and Dr Phil Phil Morley is behind this um, entirely so he's been kind of pushing this but a whole new report kind of summarizing all the studies and various bits of information that are out there about how uh, good tomatoes are for you um so tomatoes are food for health and the key message here because tomatoes like with oranges you kind of point to the vitamin c element there's kind of one message but with tomatoes it's harder to have one single message because actually they do so much for help for health um so instead we've kind of positioned them as all-round health superheroes um just to kind of bring that message home in a really sound bitey easy to understand kind of a way um, but this is a new report that was available and again it's given us content for this year but will also go on to give us content for next year um, so that's really good a bit of additional um, comms content that we've got to draw on and inspired by Rick Esch's um, Cantar presentation last year um, and we'll need to think of something similar it sounds for this year we focused very much on that lunchtime uh, eating opportunity and went big this year. And this is the first time we've themed um, British Tomato Fortnight around a particular recipe style. So we did Tom's on Toast because it's super simple. It uses quite a lot of tomatoes. It positions the premium varieties really nicely. And it's super easy to do if you're kind of working from home or at home or... Um, so we commissioned some influencers to uh, some social media influencers to come up with some official Tom's on Toast recipes. And um, we also ran a competition, which we'll talk a little bit about to kind of get um, consumers involved. But having a theme is something I think we'll do again. It's it worked really well and it helped to kind of get the buzz going. Um, and we'll probably it sounds like we'll probably need to focus again on on lunchtime um, options. So that that worked really nicely. And some of the coverage, um, I will come on to the specific numbers soon because I know uh, from first hand experience that some of you only think in numbers, um, but I just want to take a moment to just pause and look at some of the coverage. And this is just a snapshot. I've got a couple of slides with um, coverage, but this is just a tiny snapshot. I will come on to the numbers, um, but just to take a moment on this. Um, and again, thank you so much to all of you who helped us fulfill weird and wonderful requests from journalists for uh, shipping tomato plants or green tomatoes, for doing uh, interviews, um, also for kind of filling in the surveys that we were running, which helped us shape the content, um, particularly the market trends survey, and, and helped notify your contacts about what was going on. Um, just a few highlights here. So the, the Waitrose um, Health magazine was a really nice bit of coverage. Um, the tomato sales boom and the love letter to British tomatoes both came off the back of the growers survey, um, which you filled in. So thank you for that. Um, Saturday Kitchen and Duncan Tom's special shout out to him um, from the Greenhouse Sussex. Um, he did a fabulous interview with Zoe Ball on, on Radio 2, um, which was amazing. And then lots and lots of regional coverage. The most regional coverage that we've ever had um, on a BTF that I've worked on, and it's been a good few years uh, now. So that's really, really great to see. Um, really nice spread in the Yorkshire Post. And lots of you putting your hands up to do radio interviews, which is so appreciated. Um, Janan did one on her daughter's birthday, juggling about a million things um, for Radio Humberside. So it's hugely appreciated. And Richard. Diplock, thank you very much for going along with our crazy idea um, of playing classical music to um, Tomatoes for Proms for the Toms. All of it helped create this kind of um, buzz around British Tomato Fortnight and around the British Tomato. 
turning now to social media um so this was one of my my favorite things that we did uh, this year um we got some italian foodie uh, influencers with good followings to um try some british tomatoes and kind of persuaded them or rather the tomatoes persuaded them to ditch their kind of italian heritage and admit that actually british tomatoes are the best um, and it was brilliant to see this because they were really honest um, and, and the feedback that we got and that they posted and shared was amazing. Just saying that actually um, their their expectations of tomatoes is always very high being Italian. Um, but the British tomatoes were something incredible and some really nice videos and really nice photography um, that came through. So that was one of my kind of personal um, highlights of this year. We had some amazing partnerships with influencers on Instagram and TikTok. TikTok was a new channel for us this year, um, but it's growing. And I don't know, some of you might have seen on, on Instagram and TikTok earlier in the year, lots of people doing the viral um, tray bake tomato and cheese tray bakes, which were brilliant because it used a lot of tomatoes um, and required kind of premium premium options and um, so we wanted to kind of work on that basis and get influencers to back the toms on toast theme and spread the word so we got some really nice uh, a nice range of influencers signed up and the um what they did with the toms on toast theme was incredible um they just put their own kind of slant on it and really helped us spread the word far and wide so we're really pleased with that again i will come on to the numbers so you can actually see but it felt like there was a real a real buzz and again, just to that kind of buzz factor, um, just the number of posts that we had um, from people tagging us in their recipes, um, TV, so um, TV influencers, kind of reality TV stars getting involved. There was just a real sense of people kind of tagging us using the hashtags and posting about British Tomato Fortnite in a way that certainly I haven't seen before. It just felt different. And of course, my absolute um, personal highlight of BTF uh, this year, um, this needs absolutely no introduction at all, um, but thank you very much to the Flavor Fresh team and um, Andy Rowe, who I suspect might have been behind this and getting the rest of the team to do it. Um, so it really did, uh, everything everyone did made such a difference this year to that overall buzz. This picture's actually burnt on my retina, so I'll just move on from that now. So the numbers, um, one and a half thousand people visited the British Tomato Growers Association site um, when we were kind of measure it, measuring it from the, the new site being launched, which is great because to see content on a social media platform and then actually follow that through to an action to kind of visit the site for recipes or competition um, is brilliant. Um, the media coverage this year was up 76% against last year to 90 pieces. Um, and if I sound really smug about that, I am, it's amazing. And I can say that because it, it wasn't me, it's the amazing team that I work with. Um, but that was a phenomenal jump in the amount of coverage that um, was got just pouring love on the British tomato. Um, and the social media was a massive jump as well. And again, I've been talking about this buzz, but actually the numbers back that up. Um, so a 250% increase um, in terms of the reach uh, from last year to 1.5 million. And also that, that translated into engagement because it's all very well seeing something and kind of absorbing it, but it's a step further to kind of engage with it. So that was 25,000 social media likes on content that that translated to. And that was content that we were putting out through um, the BTGA channels, but also interaction with uh, what our influencers were doing, um, whether they were kind of paid partnerships or unpaid partnerships where we dropped them tomatoes. And 474 pieces of user generated content. So this is um, consumers kind of posting about the tomatoes that they're eating um, across the social platforms. So a really stunning kind of performance in terms of the numbers and this sense of buzz that was created. So thinking ahead to next year, um, the thing that we really wanted to get across and hopefully um, I, I've kind of landed that was just a massive thank you because the buzz that that happened this year was um was as a result of what we did and obviously julie is working all the time behind the scenes and the board but actually it was all of 
or everybody, all, all of the members who kind of did something, whether that was reaching out to their retailers and getting them to back it, or posting on social, doing an interview, whatever it was, um, made it all come together and it felt really different this year. And we want to carry that forward to next year. Um, so we want to say thank you, but we also want to say, please, please get involved um, with next year because this stuff really does matter. Um, if there's one thing you do now, it would be, and I know it feels really early, but it would be to start teeing up your retailer partners now, um, because before you know it, it will be Christmas and everyone will be super, super busy. Um, and then it's kind of too late. We need to be teeing up the retailers now. And that was a key learning from last year, actually. If we're getting in touch with them early next year, it's too late. So we need to be talking to them now, um, if possible. Um, and if you want to kind of get involved in a in a bigger way next year, then please email us and let us know. We're going to be forming a little um, British Tomato Fortnight HQ, um, which if you join, you'll just get kind of advanced notice of what's going on, earlier access to the materials and the plans so that you can kind of help with your planning. So if you do want to be more involved next year and join BTF HQ, um, then, then let us know and get involved. We will be sending everything to everyone, but it's really useful to have a kind of core group of members who we know um, are, are open to supporting BTF and we can sort of share materials with you and get your feedback and input on stuff early doors. And that's it from me. Nari, absolutely wonderful. And the number that's stuck in my head there, I'm one of those people that looks at numbers, 75%, wow. Um, one of the people watching has left a question along the same lines which sort of said can we align any questions practically with yourself and perhaps uh, Rakesh from Kantar on the market stats so that we can make sure that we have the best tangible impact you know may maybe something to help uh, with, with the work going forwards do you think that's a good idea? I think that's a great idea yeah I think that would be a really good idea I don't know whether I don't know it's probably a question for Rakesh because it sounds like work for him but for us, it would be useful. <laughs> well, uh, we'll see if we can put his arm up his back and see if we can get him involved and uh, get him involved early. Because I think that's a good idea. You know, let's take the data we've got, learn from it to help drive uh, the, the following year's uh, efforts. I mean, somebody else has asked another question. You know, what, what is it that we need to do extra? I mean, you've answered some of that question at the end of your presentation there. Speak to retailers now. But, you know, what, what other points do you think we, we could do to, uh, to drive it further, further forward? Definitely getting the retailers on board is, is when we looked at it and, and we paused before we started um, the kind of planning for this year, we paused with the board and ran a session just to really stop and think what are the, what are the things that are possible, what can we do that's going to make the, the kind of maximum gains and we decided that the, in terms of kind of reach and engagement, if there's one thing we can do it is getting the retailers on board earlier uh, and in a bigger way. and. That's also the trickiest thing to do, and we can do so much, and kind of Julie and the board can do so much, but it is down, it's got to be based on those personal relationships. Um, so that is the, the single biggest thing. I think what we can do to help with that is make sure that you've got more materials to kind of get them excited and get them to understand why this is a useful thing to back. Um, I, I, I'll literally be murdered if I reveal who, but um, we know that the retailers that really get behind this see a notable impact and they are measuring the data and they see a notable impact in sales so it is worth it is worth it worthwhile and obviously we've got that 75 percent change against last year uh, but are there other differences against last year i mean we've seen different trends I and mean, i mean Mikesh mentioned the lunch event you mentioned the lunch event that's clearly really important difference are there any other areas I think the shift to, you know, the, the buzz that I kept talking about, um, driven by social media, you know, that's an ongoing, it's not a quick thing that's changed, but um, social media usage has increased during COVID um, and isn't, isn't kind of showing any sign of slowing. And we're on top of that. That's why we launched TikTok um, this year, so we can kind of tap into that. Um, so I think more of that is, is, is a useful thing. But it sounds, from what Rikesh is saying, it sounds like lunchtime is again the slot that we need to be kind of um, targeting. And it's our job to figure out how we do that in the best way to make sure it results in media coverage, but also social media hits just to spread the message far and wide. 
yeah, social media. I mean, I've got some grey hair, so maybe I'm not the yeah, the target audience perhaps for, for social media. Or maybe I'm not. Maybe that's not fair. I mean, do you think the social media just just target the younger audience, or does, is it you know across the generations now? It's, it's definitely across the generations from different uh, different platforms. Um, we've got a really clear idea now of of the consumers that we're targeting because we can't, you know, we, we're if only we had Coca-Cola's budget, we don't, but we so we have to be really clear in which types of consumers we're targeting. But without fail, all of those groups are on some form of social media. So Facebook, tr kind of traditionally for slightly older um, consumers, but um, you know, TikTok, Instagram, and TikTok are, are, are no longer the place where the youngsters they've moved on. It's it's me hanging around on Instagram now. So yeah, we're kind of following where where those consumers that we're targeting are. Brilliant. And uh, any insight into what it is that Flavor Fresh might do next year? Are we? Uh, have to wait I to honestly do to think. <laughs> I'm hoping it doesn't involve Lycra. That's all I say. But I I, must, I have no more information than you. Brilliant, Nari, absolutely fantastic, wonderful figures, great result. Uh, and but a big message for me is let's roll our leaves up now and uh, get stuck in for uh, the British Tomato Fortnight 2022. Yes, Thank you ever so much for your presentation and uh, yeah, speak soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, at, at risk of uh, trying to perhaps patience beyond breaking point, we're going to just try and for the next two or three minutes just to pick up some of the key questions on energy. I know it's a change in uh, 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 subject matter dramatically, but it's such an important subject at the moment, we felt it's worth trying to pick up some of the questions that you put through for to Tim just for five minutes before we have our lunch break. So I'm hoping that, that Tim is on the line. I haven't... Hello, Aha, Phil. Here he is. Can you Hi, hear Tim. Me? And we can hear you now. Thank you for that, Tim. That's brilliant. Excellent. I have no <laughs> idea what was going on there. So let's uh, go, on, go on. Let's go with some questions and see how I do. Right. Well, I'm going to leave with a question that I had that you tried to answer before you disappear, which was impact on storage. Um, obviously, we lost rough storage a while ago. We've got very little storage now. So a, a small change in the market globally has a massive instant impact on our market for gas. Um, do, we, do we see that that's going to be put right? Are they going to open storage again? And if they do, is that going to make a mess of the summer prices when they're filling storage for, for the following winter? Um, I, in recent days, even, um, what's his name? Qua, Quasi Karteng, the bees minister, or, or, or got it wrong, but you, you know who I'm talking about, as, as, yeah. as a foot, essentially said, I don't think storage is the issue. Um, right. Now, on one hand, storage will help it has to help on the other hand we're seeing that european gas storage isn't full so yeah. if we had more storage it's just it's the gas isn't coming into the country i think the storage would help what you might call the the, the short-term transient spikes the kind of thing that we saw in base from the east storage would have helped to avoid that but i'm not such so in terms of where we are now here today if we had a load of extra storage there isn't the gas to fill it up so I don't think it would have had a massive impact on the price it would have seen. So do you think that impact has been more the, the you know the slowdown in coal development in China and Asia? Um, oh, and I their, think their switch to gas. Th there's lots of things when you, you know read sort of like the market reports. Yeah, there's there's a big been a big move to get away from coal onto gas that's increased demand. Apparently, you know, there's it hasn't rained so much in Brazil, so hydro in Brazil is down, so they want more gas. There's just you know, everybody's wanting it and some would say that the russians are playing games in, in terms of gas supply i don't know whether that's right or wrong I'll, 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 but, you know, but in, in to, to try and force through the nord stream 2 pipeline faster than it might have been uh, yeah it, it, it's it's the classic perfect storm it seems but i'm not sure that in this case more gas story would have made a material difference to uk prices no, it makes sense, Tim. I, I see what you're saying there. It just it just deals with the peaks, doesn't it? Not the uh, not long-term change, which is what we're experiencing. I mean, all the questions that have been allied to this are obviously we source a lot of our CO2 from gas, use of burning of gas. Um, and people are asking through the chat uh, 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 on the side here, you know, are we better to start looking at alternative sources of CO2? You know, doing, I mean, uh, everybody knows APS, have a, a direct pipeline to the CF fertilizer pipe, uh, factory up at Billingham, and we take CO2 from their from their process. Is that sort of concept likely to be more supported by government going forward? I, I, don't, I don't know about 
government support, but the concept is, is absolutely right. I mean, yes, the, the, the Teesside nursery back in its very early days was just way ahead of its time, wasn't it? Um, absolutely. And, and yeah, no, there are CO2 sources out there, even ones that aren't related to gas, you know, and we've got some growers already taking CO2 from AD plants, for, for example. Yeah. Um, I suppose we might hope that the shock of CO2 that people didn't even realise in, in, in wider industries, if you like, that, that's, that, that, that some of that might stick somehow and that more diverse supplies do become available. Um, the, when I, on, on the hydrogen topic that I had to rush through a bit, you know, part, a, a big part of the hydrogen sourcing, if you like, operation is, is carbon capture use and storage. Now, they, get, they talk a lot about the capture and the storage bit, but not much about use. So if all the, if these two big industrial hydrogen CCUS clusters do come to fruition, which is a lot of momentum behind it, then they ought to be producing a hell of a lot of CO2. Now, the only thing is, they'll be being paid per tonne to shove it in the ground by the government. Yeah. Yeah. And so if we want to use it, you'll have to pay at least what they would have been paid by government. Yeah, so I'm not sure point. it would give us a big cost advantage, but it could give us a security of supply. Yeah, and that's a key message. Our crops need that constant supply, not a, not you know on-off, 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 which is the, the risk of doing that, isn't it? When you burn yeah. gas yourself, you've got your, you've got, you're in control of what you do. Absolutely. Of course, yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, so, sorry, Tim. Uh, are, are we right? Am I right to can be concerned that, that we're going to start to get more and more hydrogen in the natural gas supply going forward? Therefore, less CO two if you do burn it. it, it it's again when I look at the hydrogen strategy that came out this summer, I don't think that's going to. It will. It, it, well, if hydrogen's put in the pipeline, yes, of course it will dilute the CO two producing potential. But I. I'm not seeing, in terms of those government aspirations, that we're going to be seeing big percentages of hydrogen nationally yeah. in the pipe network. You know, I think most of what they're talking about in the next 10 years, at least, is going to stay in those clusters and be used by those chemical companies almost directly yeah. or, or just used locally. I, I don't think yet that you know, within the horizon of 10 years at least, I would have thought we're, we're going to see a big impact on that. Yeah, I, I can see that, and that does, that does make sense. Um, I, I, one of the questions that have also been asked here is, what do we have to do to make that change? You know, how do we increase the, the size of our voice um, in this space? You know, because it really is a threat to the sustainability of our businesses. Um, so, you know, how do we become a bigger voice? Um. Oh, you, you, you're probably asking the wrong person here, in a sense. You know, I mean, I'm almost passing the book by saying that you know, the, the, the Tomato Growers Association is the voice. I mean, I, I'm as frustrated as you, I'm, I'm sure you are, in, in terms of he, the headlines in recent days, never mind weeks. Just, you know, it's suddenly an issue because finally you might see that food isn't getting on the shelves. And, and, and in, a, yeah. in a way, you know, Strangely, and, and this sound like it might sound a bit odd, the food industry, or particularly the, you know, the farmers and growers, have been incredibly good at keeping going regardless. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's almost taken for granted in a sense. And it's only when that final piece gets people excited because there's gaps on shelves. And and but but you've been doing a great job. You're not the problem. You keep going regardless. You, yeah. You've ensured supply. You get, you're not. We don't need to worry about you. I can see how that's perhaps the mentality um you, you're right but the problem is with that tim is when it stops it stops doesn't it you know we all work absolutely. as hard as we can you know you can't, you can't, unfortunately we can't work more than seven days a week and 24 hours in a day we could do a few more hours really but yeah know, absolutely and, and so it comes back to one of my sort of pieces on on, on the net zero thing that i have to, have to rush through a bit quick but it's like you know we have the technology and actually I saw a quote from good old Boris Johnson in the UN and it was exactly that kind of line which is I don't know whether that's worrying or not but um, you know, we have technologies here now the industry could go zero carbon now you know we can capture CO2 from the air as, as bizarre it seems we can use heat pumps you can use biomass boilers all that stuff it's about money yeah. you know we, okay the technology cost needs to and can come down but you know, consumers and retailers need to meet us in the middle some way. You know, that, that's you know, consumers, and I include myself in that, we need to realise that if we want net zero and all this stuff, then it's got to be paid for somehow. 
whether that's directly through the price of the food or whether that's through government support and intervention and therefore our taxes, it's, it's, it's got to come from somewhere. I think that's ab the absolute key message, uh, Tim. And because it's a key message, I'm going to leave everybody with that in their minds. It's, a, it's about the cost. Thank you Absolutely. so much, in fact, particularly for coming forward three times. You've had three, th three bites at the cherry to that this morning, so thank you ever so Absolutely. much for that. Absolutely, that's good. <laughs> and next year, definitely, we are meeting face to face, make it much, uh, much simpler, get rid of the uh, IT problems. Right, we have overrun slightly. Uh, I felt it was worth just uh, having that five minutes with Tim at the end there just to pick up. Uh, but we're now going to have a break for some lunch. Please, please, please take the opportunity to look at the trade stands. Remember, they are funding the, the conference, allowing us to bring this information to you, so please support them there. We're going to have a break now, and we're going to reconvene at one o'clock. And we'll see you all then. And our subject for the afternoon is another threat to the industry, which is the tomato brown goose fr fruit virus. Thank you very much indeed. See you soon.